So Isaiah for uh, beginners. This is lesson number eight in that series. The suffering servant, the suffering servant. Isaiah chapter 52 and 50, 53. So this morning I'd like to uh, look at and marvel at an amazing passage of scripture in the book of Isaiah. That's the first time I'm using the word amazing. And I'm going to be using the word amazing quite a few times as we go through this particular lesson. Uh, this particular passage is considered to be one of the closest descriptions and prophecies of Jesus' person and his work contained in the Old Testament. Now there are hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament, but this one is special. This passage is commonly referred to as the suffering servant passage in the book of Isaiah because it pictures the Messiah of Israel not as a conquering political hero, as some of the people thought he would be, uh, but as one who would save the people through his suffering. Imagine, there's the context. For us, that's a, that's a kind of familiar idea because we've, you know, we're familiar with Christianity, of course, but the idea that the people would be saved through suffering. It is an amazing, there's that second time I've used that word, amazing passage because of its accuracy in describing the person, the purpose, and the promise of God fulfilled through Jesus Christ, all foretold 700 years before his coming. It is amazing because the information contained in this passage could not be applied historically, morally, or theologically to any other religious leader in history except Jesus Christ. He is the only one who could be the suffering servant, not only in any religion, he was any one uh, or the only one rather, in the Jewish faith, in the Jewish history, in the Jewish pantheon of, of, of uh, great leaders and, and prophets, he was the only one who could fulfill this prophecy. So this lesson is a, a little bit different in that the lesson will not be you know, three ways to do this or two things about that you know, or five things to remember. The purpose of this lesson is to marvel to marvel and to be amazed as we examine this miraculous prophecy concerning Jesus, the suffering servant, as he is described by Isaiah the prophet. As always, just a little bit of background on, at, uh, for Isaiah. We know he lived in the seventh, sixth century before Christ. After Solomon died, the kingdom of Israel was divided into two, the northern and southern kingdoms. Each kingdom had its own leaders and prophets. Isaiah was a prophet in the southern kingdom and he lived in Jerusalem. He was an educated man and he came from a leading family and so he served the kings a little bit like a court minister, you know, minister to royalty if you wish. Prophets in those times served Jewish kings as religious and many times political advisors since its leaders sought the will of God in what they did as kings. This was often a source of conflict because many of the kings did not want to follow the word of the prophets uh, when they received it. They, you know, they brought the prophet in to get some news, to get some advice, to get some, you know, a word from the Lord about you know, this battle or that alliance or whatever. Uh, but many times the prophets would say, don't do that. <laughs> The Lord is against that. You won't succeed if you do that. And a lot of the kings didn't like that and they went ahead and did it anyway. So we, we read a lot about that. In this capacity, Isaiah lived and, uh, uh, and served through uh, the reigns of several kings in Jerusalem. The Talmud, which is an ancient Jewish writing with historical information and commentary. Uh, the Talmud claims that uh, Isaiah and I've mentioned this before, was sawn in two by the evil king Manasseh for prophesying uh, 
some unfavorable things. And in the New Testament, we have a reference made to this in Hebrews 11.37. I've mentioned this before, but didn't mention the source, the place where this idea comes from, and it's from the Talmud. Uh, during his lifetime, however, Isaiah saw the northern kingdom destroyed, and the Assyrian army, which conquered the north, march right to the gates of Jerusalem itself in the south. He had advised King Hezekiah not to surrender, and he prayed for the city, and an angel stopped the foreign army and saved the city. And that, the high point of his ministry, I think is that point in his life. His writings are a commentary on the things that took place in his own lifetime, but he also prophesied about future events during his time. For example, he prophesied about the fall of the Northern Kingdom, uh, about the rise of the Babylonian Empire, uh, and this a hundred years before it actually happened. He prophesied concerning the decline of Egypt as a world power, and the eventual fall of Jerusalem and its restoration under King Cyrus, who wasn't even born when he made this prophecy. So we're, you know, when I say amazing, uh, this is where we can truly use the term amazing to describe the prophecies that Isaiah made. Aside from his predictions, Isaiah also spoke of the spiritual condition of the nation and its role in the world. It is here where the image of the servant comes in. Isaiah described the nation of Israel as God's servant who at times suffered because of its relationship to God, but would one day be vindicated, one day be restored from its captivity. Now sometimes, however, Isaiah described the servant as a person, not always as a nation, but as a person, and a man who would come to serve God for a special purpose. In chapters 49 to 55, Isaiah speaks about this idea of the servant. Sometimes it's the nation who is the servant, and then sometimes it's the individual who is the servant. And the context is what determines you know, if it's the nation or if it's an individual. However, in chapters 52 and 53, Isaiah talks about the servant as a person. And what is amazing, there's that word again, is that he gives a perfect account of Jesus' life and ministry here on earth. And again, seven centuries before the time. Now, in the past, uh, you know, I've done a study with you showing why the Bible is reliable. One of the reasons why it is reliable is because it contains fulfilled prophecy. In other words, predictions of future events accurately described and then historically completed. And so in Isaiah 52, 53, these chapters contain one of the clearest examples of what's called fulfilled prophecy. Not simply the predictions of some political events in the next 50 to 100 years, but an accurate description of the Christ 700 years before he arrived. And accurate in every way, in every way it was accurate. It was accurate in describing his person. You could not, you could not fit any other person in history to the description that Isaiah provides in Isaiah 53. It was accurate in describing his purpose, the heart and the soul of the Christian religion, the reason for Christ's work is described. And it was accurately describing his promise. Through Isaiah, God promised the encouragement that sinners needed long before the Christ arrived because people back then, they knew they were sinners, they needed encouragement because they also desired to be right with God. Remember I said, we, we, we want to be perfect, we just can't. 
Well, that's not something new. That's not something that just happened you know, in AD after Christ. That's always been the way. Men have always wanted to be perfect and realized that they couldn't. And so Isaiah provided encouragement for people who were sinners, knew that they couldn't. His promise that one day, one day, uh, the Messiah would come and this, uh, this would be fulfilled. So let's go through the text and see Jesus as the suffering servant as he is described by Isaiah. <clears throat> we, begin in, uh, we begin in chapter 52, verses 13 and 14. Isaiah writes the following, behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. So here Isaiah distinguishes between the idea of the nation as servant and the Messiah as servant. Even though the nation has suffered in the past, the suffering of this individual will be great. He immediately identifies this person as a servant and as a servant who will suffer. And this is where the idea of the quote, suffering servant comes from. In modern day Judaism, people who are awaiting the Messiah, you, know, you ask them, you know, who, who's the Messiah? And they, many of them uh, will answer, the nation of Israel is the Messiah still hold to that idea. All the suffering that has taken place, you know, that the nation of Israel has suffered, the Jewish people has suffered. This is, what I, this is what they say Isaiah is talking about. This is how they rebut uh, this argument. They say all the suffering that the nation has done throughout history, this is the suffering that will eventually uh, take care of a man's sin uh, before God. And it's through the nation of Israel uh, that God will come and bless uh, the, entire, uh, the entire world. But you'll see as we read Isaiah, he's not talking about the nation of Israel when he's talking about the suffering servant. So we read in verse 15, thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him for what had not been told them, they will see. And what they had not heard, they will understand. So this verse reveals the purpose of the Messiah's ministry, and that is to cleanse, to cleanse. The priests uh, would sprinkle the people with the blood of the sacrifice as a way of signifying that the sacrifice covered their sins, cleansed them, of moral filth. The sprinkling of nations is a reference to the idea that the sacrifice of the Messiah would accomplish this, not only for the people in the physical presence of the priest, but for the entire world. That imagery of him sprinkling the nations. Even powerful men like kings will be amazed because God's plan for saving man by cleansing him from sin will finally be revealed through this servant. In Romans 16, 25, Paul talks about you know, the mystery that uh, was long held. Uh, the angels wanted to know what, what, what was the mystery? You know, and Isaiah is talking about the mystery here. The mystery is that God's servant would cleanse all the nations. In chapter 53, verse one, it says, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Here Isaiah writes as God himself would be speaking in the first person. And so God is saying that despite the things that the Messiah would do, there would be disbelief. You know, who has believed our message? And so the prophecy here is that the reaction to what the servant would do would be disbelief. And history confirms that despite the miracles and the teaching, the resurrection, the Jews at first, and then the world largely 
disbelieved. Once stated, Isaiah then goes on to describe the person of the servant, verse two and three. It says, for he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. And so he grew like a plain plant, not in a royal garden, you know, he grew without special care. This refers to the humble birth of Jesus, who although he was king, he chose to be born in a manger of poor people. His early years were not spent as a prince in splendor with attention paid to him, but in obscurity, living under submission to his parents. In his later life during his public ministry, he spent much time avoiding the crowds who merely wanted bread, the religious leaders who wanted to trap him and kill him, and his final night was spent alone in anguish and in prayer, and his last days a long ordeal of suffering and rejection and a very painful death. And he goes on to say in verses four to six, surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. See the, uh, the parallelism going on there? The parallelism. The griefs he himself bore repeats the same idea. Sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him and by his scourging, uh, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. And so in these three verses, Isaiah explains the purpose of Jesus' life and death and resurrection. In three short verses are contained the core gospel message of Jesus Christ. Now most of the Old Testament is written in poetic form and Isaiah is no exception. And as I mentioned, one poetic device used was to repeat the same idea in a variety of ways. It was called parallelism. Here, Isaiah explains that the Messiah would die for the sins of men, and he explains that in three different ways. First, he would carry our sorrow. Now, some would think that it was his sadness or his sins that he was on the cross for, but the truth of the matter was that it was our suffering and our sins that we see in his cross, in his death not his. Secondly, he would experience pain. He was pierced, he was crushed, he was chastened, he was scourged. That we should experience when God would judge and condemn us. He's describing the type of punishment that we deserve. Death, condemnation from God, these things cause pain and the Messiah would experience that pain on behalf of each person so that when they came before God, they would not have to. And then thirdly, he will save others by suffering their punishment, vicarious atonement, vicarious atonement. He will bring those who are lost back home again by suffering the consequences of their lostness on their behalf. All the things that happen to those who stray away from God, the Messiah will bear so they can go home to be with the Lord. 
vicarious atonement. Atonement means the making up of, the paying for, and vicarious means for someone else, someone doing it for someone else. The suffering servant paying the price, suffering the pain for the sins of others. And so Jesus, um, the apostles, and every person who has ever tried to preach the good news of salvation has repeated this idea to their hearers that God sent the Messiah to die for sinners, but Isaiah explained it 700 years before it actually took place. We read in verse seven, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. Now here in verse seven, Isaiah returns to describe the spirit with which the Messiah would enter into this suffering. Unlike the nation who suffered, remember I mentioned before one of the things that even modern Jews say is that the nation of Israel is the suffering servant. But here Isaiah describes the way that the servant would you know, uh, suffer, the attitude that he had uh, during this time of suffering. Unlike the nation of Israel who suffered, yes, but they suffered because of their own rebellion. They suffered because of their own disobedience uh, to God. And uh, they were punished by God and they didn't bear their suffering willingly. They, they bore it, but they bore it with complaining you know, they were in the desert and they complained and God refused to you know, answer their prayers and they would complain and God would punish them and discipline them and they would complain. That's not the description that we have here of the suffering servant. Here the suffering servant would be unjustly punished, unjustly tortured, unjustly killed. And yet Isaiah said, he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before its shearers so that he did not open his mouth. The individual servant, the Messiah, would accept his suffering without complaint, without resistance. His suffering was due not for his own sins, but as a command of God for the sins of others. And for this reason, he bore it quietly and without resistance. For to resist was to resist God. To refuse was to lose man's opportunity for salvation. In verse eight, Isaiah continues, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. Here, another poetic device. After uh, describing the person and the purpose of the servant, the author, which is God, asks a question of the readers. Once the Messiah was unjustly killed and taken away, who among his own generation or people realized that it was for their own sins that this has happened and not his own. And once again, the ideas of disbelief and misunderstanding are brought up. We know that the Jews did not believe he was the Messiah and they rejected completely the idea that his death was for their sins and do so to this very day. They considered him a blasphemer and a troublemaker until the very end, even to this day, they consider him a troublemaker. Verse nine, he, his grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit found in his, in his mouth. Here the writer says that even in death, he would be justified. 
You see, evil men at that time, evil men and criminals were buried in common graves. They were cut off from the people. But even though Jesus was considered this by the people, he would nevertheless be buried in a proper grave. And we know that uh, Jesus was removed from the cross by Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea and buried in a new tomb near the place where he died, not, not in, a common, uh, in a common grave. Uh, even though he died like a criminal, he was buried like a just man. We read about that in the New Testament in John chapter 19, verses 38 to 42. Now in the last verses, the promise or the result of the Messiah's suffering is explained. Again, this is explained in different ways. Verse 10, the result of the Messiah's suffering explained. So verse 10, but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. So the servant will live to see his descendants, those who will come after him. And God's will will be done through him. In other words, the pleasure of the Lord will prosper uh, in his hand. And of course, the Messiah did see his offspring, we're his offspring. Generation after generation, he saw the fruit uh, that his sacrifice bore uh, in the offspring um, of faith uh, that we are and generations of Christians uh, are to this day. In verse 11, it says, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. So God's will will be done. The, uh, is this verse 11? Right. The servant, through his suffering, will live to see the justification, meaning the forgiveness and the salvation of those who will come after him. He's going to see the fruit of his labor, the product of his suffering. Verse 12, therefore I will allot him a portion with the great and he will divide the booty with the strong because he poured him out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. In other words, he will be considered great because of his work as atoning sacrifice, his work as mediator between God and sinners. In other words, because of his suffering, the servant will save many and will himself live to see these and will be exalted by God. Here is a reference to the resurrection that God will see uh, the establishment of the church and for 2000 years he's observed uh, you know, the growth of the church, the salvation of souls, all of it, all of it based on his original uh, sacrifice. Now in this passage uh, written 700 years before the appearance of the Messiah, Isaiah describes perfectly three things that we now know about Christ Jesus. First is his personality. This description of his attitude and how he was perceived, how he was treated, and how he reacted could not fit any other Jewish character or any other religious leader throughout history. No one else fits this profile except Jesus. Secondly, these passages describe Jesus' purpose. The doctrine of salvation by substitutionary atonement is perfectly explained here. I mean, it's amazing, it's amazing. He describes the theology behind what 
behind what God is doing. He explains why God is doing what he will be doing 700 years before God actually does it. And I'm not saying that Isaiah is amazing. Isaiah was a man, a human like we are. God could have chosen any one of us to, to do this task. When I say amazing, it's, it's amazing what God did through Isaiah. And so his purpose, you know, vicarious, substitutionary atonement, not animal sacrifice, which had been practiced for uh, hundreds of years, but the willing sacrifice of God's own chosen servant on behalf of all sinners. That was, that was what Isaiah predicted. This is the basis of Christianity. Again, no other religion has this as its central feature. No, no other religion has as its central feature the way that God removes the sin from men. Uh, we're, Christianity is the only religion that has that as its central feature. Other religions have ceremonies and they have stories and they have you know, all kinds of things like that. They have uh, pilgrimages, uh, uh, but none of them uh, explain in detail how God makes you holy. And then of course, he explains his promise. The prophecy even goes beyond the time that the actual events are going to take place. In the passage, Isaiah describes the promise that God makes to the Messiah and to those who will benefit from his appearance. So to the Messiah, the promise is that death will not be able to hold him because, uh, of, because he is sinless. The empty grave and the witness of the apostles confirmed this. The angels are witnesses that he is at the right hand of God. Isaiah spoke of this way, way, way before all of this took place. And then to those uh, who accept him, the promise was that their sins will be forgiven and that the punishment that they would have to endure forever has now fallen on the suffering servant. And so you know, God makes the promise to the servant that he will rise again. He'll live to see the you know, the benefit of his sacrifice. And then he makes a promise to those, you know, who depend on the sacrifice, what they will be receiving as well as, as, as their gift uh, from God. So as, as marvelous as it is, Isaiah's prophecy could only describe what a person could look forward to, could hope for in the future. While he lived, they had only the sacrifice of animals to appease their consciences for sin. And this only reminded them of sin. It didn't cleanse their guilty consciences. Imagine the pain of living with this idea. You know, we, we preach the gospel, we encourage each other you know, to, uh, to remember Jesus and to understand that his sacrifices literally removed our sins from us, they're no longer on us. They, in the time of Isaiah, they did not have that idea. The, the priest would make the sacrifice, the atonement once a year to remind them, you're sinners. This is what's required for sin. Sin causes death, so on and so forth. Isaiah was saying, but one day, someone will come who will remedy that, who will take care of that. He'll take your sins and he'll take them upon himself and you'll be free from that. Wow, what a, what a, what a promise. Of course, we on the other hand, we have the blessing of having seen Isaiah's prophecy fulfilled and having access to the sacrifice of the Messiah to wash away our sins, 
and to guarantee our salvation and to protect us against the judgment which is to come. What he, through the miracle of prophecy, saw, we, through the word of God, have access to today. And that is the opportunity to be saved through Jesus Christ. So if you understand and believe Isaiah's prophecy and have a need for forgiveness, then of course, uh, today we know what to do. Uh, don't usually extend uh, invitations during the class. Uh, we, we do it you know, usually during the sermon, but this class uh, begs uh, us to be reminded uh, that in order to take advantage of the sacrifice of Jesus, uh, we confess his name, we repent of our sins, and we're buried with him in the waters of baptism, and the blood of Christ washes away, fulfills Isaiah's prophecy in our own life, and we rise anew as cleansed as sinners uh, looking forward to an eternity with God in heaven. All right, well, that's the lesson on the, the amazing passage in Isaiah the, called the suffering servant. Next week, we're going to continue, uh, select another uh, passage from Isaiah to, uh, to review. And uh, just another reminder that I've, I've left uh, some uh, outlines and class notes for lesson number seven, which was last week. I've left those back there if you collect those. All right, that's our lesson for this week. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>